There's a temple in Bali where you have to be on your guard because the monkeys that live there have learned a new trick. They watch the tourists. And what they're watching for is the belongings that the tourists are carrying. The monkeys have evolved a completely new behavior. When they see tourists carrying expensive objects, they'll jump down, sneak up, they'll take those objects away, and then they'll climb up and hide on high spots out of reach. But they're not trying to get the objects, they're trying to get food. So they'll sit and taunt the tourists with their foster grants until the tourists realize that they have to pay a ransom. And this ransom is in the form of food, which is then paid over to the monkeys. Now, if that food is presented in sufficient quantity and the quality is good enough, then the items that have been stolen are duly returned to their owners and everybody departs happily. So the monkeys have evolved an entirely new way of behaving. Uh, this new behavior gets them food and they've learned it over a, a period of years. You could almost say that is evolution. So we'll return to those monkeys a little bit later on. Global warming. It's a phenomenon that's variously described between extremes from we're doomed, mass extinction is inevitable, you're all going to die. So, hey guys, soon beach holidays are going to be a lot warmer. I think this needs uh, a little bit more of a perspective, and that's what I'd like to look at today. Uh, that the Earth is warming is not disputed. It's well documented in scientific evidence. And one of the ways in which this is studied is fascinating, and it involves looking at the oxygen isotopes in water. Now, oxygen exists in two forms. The normal one is oxygen-16, and the alternative form is oxygen-18. And the difference between the two is that oxygen-18 has two extra neutrons in its nucleus, and this makes it very slightly heavier. Now, oxygen is used by organisms in the water to make um, shells, because it goes through the, the food chains, and ultimately it appears in compounds such as calcium carbonate. So organisms that make little shells might actually reveal how the uh, oxygen components within the water vary. And it turns out that the oxygen-18 is more likely to be in the water during periods of time when the, the Earth is very cold with ice caps. And oxygen-16 is more likely to be present in the water in greater quantities uh, when the ice caps are absent. So could the fossils then be used to reveal to us the history of warming and cooling events on the Earth? Well, a pioneer in this field was Professor Sir Nick Shackleton, who worked at Cambridge. And he used to work on little organisms called Globigerina. Isn't that a beautiful little thing? What Nick did is he developed a technique which involved um, analysis of the shells of these things using mass spectrometry. And using that, he was able to work out the ratios between the two isotopes in the shells and tally that with the age of the actual fossil. Now, what was revealed was that uh, during times when there were ice caps, the water that evaporates into the air is cooled a little bit more quickly than at other times. And so the rain and falls a little bit sooner, and the earliest rain to fall contains most of the oxygen-18. And the reason for that is oxygen-18 is very slightly heavier, and therefore it's going to condense first. And so the sea is enriched with oxygen-18. Meanwhile, the rest of the air carries on towards the polar regions, where it will finally fall with probably as snow. But by that time, the oxygen-18 is no longer present, and the air that arrives at the poles is enriched with oxygen-16. And so as it falls the snow, the snow itself becomes a repository and locks away oxygen-16. So the ice caps at the poles are indisputably evidenced by the fossils, and further work more recently has helped to reinforce this. This is a picture of a clam. Clams are much longer lived than foraminiferida, which is the fossil you saw just now. These have annual growth rings. And so if you take these fossils and section them, it's possible to look at the growth rings individually and to look at the oxygen isotope ratios within those rings on an annual basis, thereby gaining a fluctuating pattern from year to year. But the growth rings also show another difference. 
they show a difference in thickness depending on how well the animal was fed that year. So on a good year, the growth ring is going to be wider, and on a poorer year, the growth ring will be narrower. And so it's possible to take the shells and to match them up so that you can determine how the patterns of growth rings overlap and establish by comparing successively older shells, eventually with fossil shells, a complete growth ring record going back many years, possibly even thousands of years. And this is called sclerochronology. And what it's allowing scientists to do is to develop a, a record, if you like, of global temperature changes, which are recorded in the oxygen isotopes in the growth rings of the shells of these clams. And this is very similar to the way in which they've uh, collated um, dendrochronology data to look at dating with carbon dating as well. So what's emerging from all of this is the pattern that shows us that when ice is present at the poles, it locks away the oxygen 16, and so the sea becomes enriched with oxygen 18. All the organisms which live in there show an increase in oxygen 18 within their shells at that time. Conversely, at other times, when there are no poles, the reverse is true, because the melting ice returns the oxygen 16 to the water, where it dilutes among the whole isotope ratio. The ice itself is also a repository of information, because it contains the oxygen isotopes too. So ice drills and cores can be used to reinforce the data which is emerging or has emerged from the studies of the fossils. The picture is very firm now about the warming of the, of the Earth. So if we have this pattern, uh, how far should we go before we start descending into mass panic? Well, it really depends on how you look at the data, I think. So let's suppose we showed that uh, global warming data just over the last 100 years. What you can see is a clear trend. The Earth's warming up. Over the last 100 years, that's a convenient time scale, isn't it? Because it allows us to point that finger of accusation, you know, human pollution, industrialization, is all our fault. But what about if we change that time scale a little bit? And now look at it over a period of 40,000 years. Now we can see that, yes, we are in a period of time when the world's warming up, no doubt about it. But it's just another warming in a repeating natural sequence of warming and cooling that the Earth has. It's a natural rhythm. It's possible then that we human beings are just accelerating what's already inevitable. So why are we upset about that? Well, if the world's going to warm up, the ice caps are going to go, we're going to lose ecosystems. Habitats are going to go. Big cuddly creatures are not going to have anywhere to live. And we're going to be a bit sad. Who wants the polar bear to go extinct? Probably none of us. But that might be an inevitability. And so we're going to be emotional and worried. And we're going to have global agreements between nations to try and stop all this from happening. We're trying to stop something which is happening irrespective of our own activities, even if we are accelerating it, of course. So what about a new perspective? Suppose I stood here now 10,000 years ago, not today. What would I then be saying to you? Uh, I'm a bit upset. The woolly mammoth is just about to go extinct, everyone. We're not going to see it again. Big furry animal, great grand creature. It's a tragedy. But what about if I now walk forward in time from that moment? Now what do I see? I see the emergence of an entirely new bunch of creatures animals, plants. I'd see the emergence of the glorious biodiversity of a rainforest. I'd see the evolution of intricate new orchids. I'd see the fragrance of a bluebell wood and the fabulous biodiversity of a coral reef. You see, life always finds a way to bounce back. One argument is that uh, evolution takes an awfully long time. Well, I'd argue it a little bit differently from that. I think evolution carries on at a pace that suits necessity. After all, 
It can't have taken those baboons millions of years to learn the difference between a Cartier and a Timex. So, if I really could time travel like Doctor Who, what would I do? Well, I'd actually go backwards, because I'd want to see the fossil plants I study growing in their natural environment and in all their glory, see what they really were like. I might like to go and see a Tyrannosaurus. But I'd never go forwards, because by doing that, I might just spoil the coming evolutionary surprise. Thank you.